Hello everybody, here we go then, Formula 2 in 2023. So much to discuss, so much to get into and to delve into some of the talking points ahead of this season. I'm joined in person, by the way, very nice to see you guys, uh, by Inside F2 writers Lawrence Griffin and Aaron Harper. We don't have to worry about any buffering today. Very nice to see you. Are we, uh, yeah, wintered out and uh, ready to get back into the to the to the swing of things, Lawrence. Yeah, definitely ready for the excitement of Formula Two to to come back. It's been a it's been a long old wait, so I'm ready for it to to come back. Testing into the first race, get back stuck in. Yeah, there's uh, it, yes, yeah, not long away now at all, is it? So, Aaron, are you uh, ready to go for the season? Raring to go? I am absolutely. It does make me wonder how we managed to get through the. The years where the the seasons finished in October yeah. and started in late March. Now it's like almost Christmas when seasons finish and they start again like the end of February. It's, it's almost nowadays seems too long, but even there, back then it was even longer. So, uh, yeah, all refreshed, ready to go for another new season of Formula 2 action. Yeah, really exciting. So much to look forward to this season as well as we're going to get stuck in. And tell you what, let's get stuck straight into it. Teo Porsche returning this season. Um, I'll be honest with you, that was one that surprised me. Aaron, I know you've been on our Instagram at Inside Formula 2. Uh, if you're not following us on Instagram, go and check it out. Uh, is uh, Yeah, you were saying that you're not surprised that Teo Porsche is returning. Lawrence, were you surprised that he returned? It almost feels like he has not much left to prove and a lot to lose. Yeah, it does. Um, I think that's because we expect drivers to come up from a from a junior category and perform immediately. And if they don't, they don't really have long to to stick around. And obviously, Teo Pocher had a wonderful rookie season in Formula 2 and was expected to follow that up with the title. A lot of people, I think me included, thought that he would win last season. But then you have a driver as complete as Felipe Drogovic who comes along and that completely changes things. I think we've got to remember about um, about Teo Pocher is he's still incredibly young. He's still a lot younger than several of the other of the drivers that we won't be asking that same question of, even some drivers that are coming up from Formula 3. So he still has plenty of time to learn and to develop. And with somebody in the later years of their career, like Valtteri Bottas at Sauber at the moment, and Teo Pocher being in the Sauber Academy, he could really be setting himself up really well. I don't know where else he would go outside of Formula 2 that would have given him such a good opportunity. I think if he wins the title this season, reinforces his quality, he's in really good shape for next year. Do not think, though, that like Oscar Piastri sat on the sideline, not sat on the sidelines, but, you know, he was fully integrated into the Alpine team last season and he, he benefited from being trackside. Do you not think Teo Pocher would have benefited from spending a year out of racing and, and getting to know the Formula 1 team? I don't think it's necessarily a year out of out of racing that he would need, but I think it would be great this year to see him more integrated with that team because that just means that if he does, if and when he does make that step up, it'll be so much smoother when he knows all the engineers, he knows all the personnel, and he is able to make that good first step into a, a junior career in, in Formula One. Yeah, absolutely. Aaron, obviously you said on our Instagram, as I've said, that you weren't surprised to see him back. Why, why weren't you surprised? Well, he's still got something left to achieve in Formula 2, isn't he? He's got to win the championship, and that is his big aim for this season. It's, it's his third season, and you can look at it and say, OK, yeah, he's taken three seasons. If he goes on and wins it this season, he's taken three years to win it. But like Lawrence mentioned, he is incredibly young. There is still something there for him to achieve, and I think even regardless of his achievements this season, he'll take that sort of sideline role in the Sauber Audi group next year uh, depending on what happens with their Formula 1 team I think Bottas is locked down for another year uh, Joe might have just the, the one year deal perhaps um, so there could be a potential opening for him next season to drive but like you mentioned with Oscar Piastri that year on the sidelines would be beneficial he'd embed himself in the team he'd get some practice sessions and also remember every weekend that he's not driving next season if that's the case if he wins the, the championship in Formula 2 this year his stock will only rise, which is a bizarre phenomenon because he's not doing anything to make people think, I oh, know he shouldn't be in that seat. And every time that he's not in that seat and someone's underperforming, it's like, OK, yeah, he should be. Hmm. So that's the sort of position he's got to put Sauber Audi in uh, for next season and almost make it a, a given that he goes into the seat for 2024 yeah. or 2025. Absolutely. I, think it, I think it makes sense as well being in Formula 2 rather than being on the sidelines, Oscar Piastri managed to make that a success. 
But Oscar Piastri, after winning Formula Renault, Formula Three, Formula Two, was the hottest property in the in the sort of all the feeder series. So I think for to expect Teo Pocher for that to work for him, it's maybe not quite as likely we could perhaps see him go more down the route of say a Callum Eilat. Um and you know obviously that's not what he wants because he wants to get into into Formula One. So I think I think really although it's a surprise, it will it will work for him in the end. I think. Mm. It's a really exciting opportunity for him, especially with the team, uh, Sauber Formula One team, obviously emerging with with Audi. I think that's an exciting proposition for for Terry Pochet moving forward, isn't it? Let's move on then. Uh, in terms of who his title contender or who his uh, his rivals are going to be for the title, Aaron, who do you think uh, is going to be up there with him? So I think Jack Doohan is the name on everybody's lips because he's shown that he has got massive pace and. Behind Felipe Drogovic last year, Jack, Jack Doohan was the second highest pole scorer. And so there was a couple of his victories where he just disappeared. He did things that it almost seemed nobody else in the field could do. You think back to the victory at Silverstone where he managed the wet tyres into a drying track and kept them going, whereas other drivers were, were chewing them up and you know they, they were really, really struggling. And then a victory, I think, at Spa as well. It was That's a driver's circuit. If, if you're a proper driver, you, you, you can make a car work around there. And he's got a style that's really, really fast. And it, I love watching him drive. He, I think he's, he's there, the talent's there. He's just got to put it all together. And there were some races last year, if you can take the Abu Dhabi finale in, you know, as like an isolated picture of his season that kind of tells a story the pace was there he was on course for a really good result maybe even the victory but the wheel literally fell off <laughs> so if he can you know put it all together there's no reason why he can't be in contention for a championship battle with say a Teo Porsche or perhaps Ayumu Owasa for dams this season there's lots of drivers in in the Formula 2, Formula 2 field every year who will go in thinking they have a shot of the championship and they do but how many of them actually then put it together is a real indication of whether they're ready to go into Formula One or another really high performing category. Oh, that's is an interesting one, Lawrence, isn't he? Is he ready to fight for a title this season? I think he might well be. Um, we saw how brilliantly he performed right at the back end of last season in Abu Dhabi, holding off Felipe Drogovic. And what was so startling after that was he was so focused on I need to improve. I need to do better. He didn't really t even take a minute after the race to celebrate his victory. He is so driven and so focused and he has that raw speed. He has the ability to race wheel to wheel with, with the best of them. And I think, you know, depending on what his preparations have been over the winter, I think he can look like a really complete driver this season. And so I wouldn't be surprised to see him right in the, in the title fight from day one. Yeah, I mean, Dam's a strong team, uh, know how to win a title previously as well, don't they, in, in this category. Um, we've had a question that's come in. So Sean asks, can MP Motorsport maintain their championship winning form in 2023? And I suppose uh, uh, one fr from me, building on top of that, if you like, is, De can, is, is Dennis Hauger a, a championship contender? Or uh, for that matter, is Johan de River a championship contender? I think... It would it would be harsh to to rule someone like Dennis Hauger out with the pedigree he has from Formula Three. We know how much talent he has. The interesting case with MP Motorsport is what we've seen over the past few years is the connection between driver and engineer is so important in this series that you can have someone like Felipe Drogovic do wonderful things with that car that his teammates have struggled to do. And so for Dennis Hauger to come in, I think it's not as simple as ex Formula 3 champion comes into title winning car and therefore wins because he had a title winning car last season when he stepped into what was Oscar Piastri's team. So I think it's actually going to be far more difficult for MP Motorsport this season than people think. That said, that team now has experience of, of winning and they won't want to let that slip. And both Hauger and especially De Ruvula have a wonderful amount of experience. So I think that that team can perform well. I just don't see them performing to the extent they did last year, but I'd love to be proved wrong. 
Yeah, it's going to be a really interesting dynamic throughout the season, is it? Isn't it? Can can MP Mo Sport, uh, yeah, uh, have a season as well, as good as they did last season? Uh, a lot of rookies this season, Aaron. Uh, a com- really competitive Formula Three season last season, uh, and yeah, it was obviously uh, won by Victor Martins. Uh, but there were so many different drivers that were, you know, that sh- that, that stood out at certain points of the season. Who, what, which rookie are you most excited to see in Formula Two this season? Well, you've got the whole top three trio from last season's Formula 3 Championship all in what we would expect to be front-running cars in Formula 2. So you've got Victor Martins in alongside Teo Pochera at ART. Uh, Oliver Behrman has joined Prima alongside Fred Vesti. And Zane Maloney has gone into Carlin alongside Enzo Fittipaldi. So I think that's a really good uh, step for them three to be taking. And it shows that the talent in Formula 3 is coming through and that they can jump into those cars immediately because they're impressing enough. I know, obviously, Victor Martins was with ART in Formula 3, and that kind of makes sense to have like a, a ladder through the junior formula. So those are the three to look out for because they've got relatively established Formula 2-level teammates in Enzo Fittipaldi, Teo Porcher, and Fred Vesti. All race winners. Almost. Well, Fittipaldi not yet, but I'd expect that this season. So they've got a good yardstick for their performance and how they get on will be really, really interesting. But, you know, you you never know who who can shine. We've seen it before. Drivers have come through from Formula 3, not necessarily done spectacular. Take Yuki Tsunoda, for example, jumped in a Formula 2 car and all of a sudden he's a a race winner and he's moving on to Formula 1 and and doing things in that. So who knows? it could just be right place, right time. And like Lawrence mentioned, the relationship between driver and engineer, if you find yourself in the right place at the right time, the world is your oyster. So it's a really strong lineup at Prima in particular. I, for, for me, anyway, I think Fred Vesti had a great rookie season last season, and I think he could build a little bit more on that and uh, potentially even be a title contender. And then the, the raw talent of Oli Behrman uh, at such a young age. We saw, obviously, Terry Paul Scher step up at a young age, and we know how good he's been. Is that an exci- is that one of the most exciting uh, lineups on the grid, Lawrence? The Prima lineup? Yeah, the Prima lineup. I, I think so. I think so. You've got that perfect combination, as, as you mentioned, of raw talent and speed coming up from formula three and the same amount of speed and experience as well from formula two last season i think fred vesti is another one who's really mature who will have really learned and he'll i hope he's having the right tutorage from um from mercedes of course as a mercedes junior driver i think that'll be a, a wonderful combination but you look at art and the lineup they have with Porcher martins and Carlin with Maloney and Fitty Powley, they've got that same blend of really fast rookie and really experienced second driver, or not second driver, I should say, but the driver that's already been been around in Formula Two. So yeah, those three in particular will be ones to watch. And then you've got teams like High Tech, where you've got Crawford and Hadjar in there, and you've just got two amazing young Red Bull talents, and Isaac Hadjar is still 18 years old. And such a wonderful, wonderful talent. And so it'll be brilliant to see how high tech get on as well. Yeah, and particularly with those two drivers, obviously the wraparound support from the Red Bull team as well will obviously be really beneficial for them, won't it? So, uh, yeah, could they could they be dark horses, Aaron? Do you think they could uh, compete for the title? Or do you think that's maybe a little bit of a long shot considering the, the, the lack of experience potentially in that team? It's definitely a possibility because we've seen it done before. Charles Leclerc, George Russell, Oscar Piastri have all come from Formula 3 and won the Formula 2 championship at the first attempt. So nothing's out of the possibility there. If high tech deliver, then they've got two really fast young drivers in that team. I know it doesn't quite work this way in Formula 2, but almost you'd you'd put them in this year and and bed them in for next year and hope that they can take the learnings from Season 1 into Season 2. But they're, they're... the way the Formula 2 grid moves around, they'll probably move on to somebody else. But, you know, the, high tech have, have done really well. They've had strong drives. They've just not put the whole season together, unfortunately. With two rookies, it could be interesting if, if that is the case, if they start putting that season together, how those two then deal with it. But they're a very effective team, and I'm sure they'll give at least one of their drivers an opportunity to win a race, if and hopefully they take it. 
Yeah, absolutely. Really excited to see the battle at the front this season. It's going to be, in my opinion, one of the most competitive seasons we've seen in Formula 2 in, uh, in a long time. Uh, we've got a new team in Formula 2 this season, haven't we? We've got PHM Racing, who are coming in in partnership with Charus. Um Yeah, nice to have a fresh team in Formula 2, Lawrence. Yeah, definitely. It's always nice to see that, that new teams can join. We saw VAR last season. And actually, I think they've built, built up really well. And Juan Manuel Correa was really complimentary of, of them. Of course, he's been around the block and he's been in Formula 2 before. So I think it is proof that new teams can come in and they can, and I hope VAR show this season as well, they can make a success of it. And PHM not coming in as a totally fresh team, but as coming in in partnership with Shrews, I think that's going to be a really lovely combination. So excited to see how they get on. Yeah, absolutely. And you've mentioned J.M. Correa there. You've nicely given me a nice segue there, Lawrence, into J.M. Correa. I wanted to talk about him. Obviously, first full-time season or first time back in a full-time seat in Formula 2 uh, since 2019. Uh, what what does a successful season look like for him, Aaron? So a successful season, I think, for him is building a, a competitive level in terms of regular points. Um, I don't think we should be expecting huge things from him obviously because of the accident and the injuries that he suffered. But he's back here and he, I think he's just going to go and enjoy it. That, that for Those first few races, he's going to race with a bit of freedom, I think, and just go and enjoy it and embrace the opportunity that's come back to him. And then he can build on becoming a, a force again in, in Formula 2. So, you know, it's great to have him back. And I think it, it's a really nice touch to remember, obviously, Antoine Hubert, who sadly passed away in that accident. It's, it's really nice to have J.M. Carrera back and, you know, he, he'll be racing, as we always do, for, for Antoine. I, I think it's it's amazing to see his his sort of psychological resilience to be able to come back and compete at this level. Getting behind the wheel of a race car after that accident is one thing, but to be able to perform like he has been in Formula 3, you can't have a moment of, of sort of hesitation, of, of doubt in your mind. Um, I remember listening to Christian Horner speak about his journey through the Junior Series and that he saw Juan, um, Juan Pablo Montoya come past him and the way he angled the car into the corner, he just went, I can't do that. My brain won't let me do that. You, you have to be able to commit totally and realise that you are risking your safety every corner you turn because you're right on the limit. And unless you're able to do that, you won't compete at this level. So the fact that Juan Manuel Correa has not only been able to return to the sport, but to be able to return at this level and to have moved back up, like you say, to have recovered so quickly, it's it's one of one of the, the best sort of feel-good stories we've had in the sport in a long, long time, I think. I'll be delighted to see to see how he gets on. It really is a feel-good story, as you say. And, uh, yeah, um, really excited to see how he gets on this season. Uh, but, yeah, it's, it's a great story, isn't it? Absolutely. OK, let's get into the fun part of the show, all right? This is predictions for the season, and I have no doubt we will revisit this at the end of the season, and we'll be laughing at these predictions uh, come the end of the season. So we've broken it down into five uh, five or six different categories. So the, the first one is the first new winner of 2023 so with the seven drivers who have won a formula formula two race already they're dennis hauger johan derubla terry porsche frederick vesti ayumu owasa jack duen and richard for sure so who is going to be the first new winner of 2023 i'm looking at you thinking who am i coming to first i'm going to go aaron you're going to come first uh or i think enzo fittipaldi okay because carlin are on a a good trajectory. They've got two really good drivers in Zane Maloney and Enzo Fittipaldi. It could easily be Zane Maloney because he's coming off the back of three feature race wins in a row in for Formula 3. So don't rule him out. But I'm going to plump for, for Enzo as the, ne as the next new winner. It's his chance. He's got to go and make it work. He's got to go and get that victory early on if he wants to win the championship. Timo on Twitter says Zane Maloney. Sean says Jack Crawford. Jenny says Victor Martins. He's just come off the back of a championship, so he'll be extra confident at the start of the season. Lawrence, who do you think is going to be our first new winner? I'm going to massively cop out on the, of this and, and say, with the first race being a sprint race, it is so hard to predict who's going to qualify 10th and end up on reverse grid pole <laughs> and then you, you throw into the fact that into the mix that it's Bahrain where we see a lot of overtaking high degradation it's it's so hard to know 
what I will say is I have a prediction for the first feature race winner. Go on. And I think that's going to be Arthur Leclerc. Wow. I think for someone like his style, I think is very suited to Bahrain, the way he can move through the field. And I think as long as he manages the tyres well, I could see him doing something similar to what Charles Leclerc did back in 2017 and sort of blaze a path through the field. I'd love to see that. Um, now I've said it, it won't happen, but it would have <laughs> been nice. you cursed him to a, a, a retirement on the first lap, haven't you? Yeah, I have. I, ha- I have, definitely. <laughs> turn one turn one accident now. Yep. That is a big prediction, Arthur Leclerc. He needs to sort his qualifying out if, uh, that, if, if that is to be the case, because uh, really qualifying does. was probably his weakness last year in Formula 3, yeah. wasn't it? But... He'll, he'll qualify 10th then and he'll win the sprint race. <laughs> and it's, there you it's, go, job it's, done. It's funny how many, how many parallels I, I, I draw to his, to his brother, Charles. In 2018, I believe Leclerc was joining Ferrari as the worst qualifier in terms of if you were to split up his three sectors throughout the lap, his actual eventual lap time was the worst in comparison to what you'd put together his best three sectors, so he couldn't string a lap together. Vettel in 2018 was the best in in the championship for doing that. Then in 2019, he was far stronger. So drivers, like his brother did in Formula 1, drivers can make that step up. And if Leclerc does make that step up in qualifying, like you say, we have drivers who come into Formula 2 who had certain weaknesses in Formula 3 where they just almost become completely unrecognisable. And so maybe that will be the, the case for Leclerc. If he does qualify then, wow, he's going to definitely be joining the conversation for, for the title. Absolutely, because race pace was not an issue last year at all, was it? So, uh, interesting. Okay, Uh, the biggest positive surprise. Lawrence, we'll come to you first for that one. I think it's difficult because I don't necessarily think it would be that much of a surprise, but I think Zayn Maloney, with the incredible run that he had through the back of last season, I think it was the last three feature races he won in in Formula 3, and then added to the mix that he got an outing in Abu Dhabi last year in in a Formula 2 car, the way we saw Jack Doohan do the same the previous season, then he came to Bahrain last season and put it straight on pole. I think we could see Zayn Maloney, Zayn Maloney doing something very similar. I think he's a he's a really talented driver. Mm, absolutely. Timo says Frederick Vesti is a good shout for that one. James says Ollie Behrman. Aaron, who do you think? I'm going to go with the Maori Cordial because he had a very messy first half of 2022 which resulted in a race ban at Silverstone I believe it was and then he'd come back in Austria and was actually very accomplished and he picked up some points towards the end of the season he's had a little bit of a a, a flirt with the law away from Formula 2 <laughs> over the winter but hopefully he can put his recent good form on the track to good use now with Virtuosi and, and Jack Doohan he's got a really good benchmark to see just how good he really is and I think, you know, we could maybe expect some podiums from, from Cordill because the pace is certainly there. It's just putting it all together and keeping things clean. And he showed that he can do that in the second half of the season. So, you know, there's a bit more to come from him, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to, you, you've segued into the next section. Where, well, uh, I, we'll, we'll skip one and we'll come back to another one, right? Because the, the next one is the first to lose their seat, okay? Uh, and when we put this out... Um, Omri Cordill got two of the votes to lose his seat first, which kind of contradicts what you said, Aaron. We had another, so Sean says uh, Maney uh, to lose his seat first. Uh, Lawrence, who do you think is... We Obviously, we don't want anyone to lose their seat. Of course not. But no. there is always some turnaround in Formula 2. We know there's a bit of changeover. So if one, if so, if there was to be a bit of turnover, who do you think it will be? Well, I, I've also gone for Cordill. Um, there's, you know, the... The accumulation of penalty points, off off track stuff, notwithstanding, um, I think out of all of the lineups, when you look down the grid, I think Virtuosi is one where you can see a clear first and second driver in terms of how good Jack do in this bin, and I think there is a possibility for Cordial to end up as as firmly the second driver, and that might sort of hide how good he actually is and and the speed that he has um so i think he he might struggle aaron that uh contradicts what you were saying <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm the lone voice of hope for Mary cordial it seems um i'm gonna go for ralph boshong much to uh jim kimberley's dismay <laughs> we know he he works very hard to get funding and 
to almost put put it into real world perspective, there are a lot of problems in the real world at the moment. So funding might be difficult. So there might be an occasion where he has to skip a race because he hasn't got the money for the seat or or something. So I hope that doesn't happen because I think Ralph is an excellent competitor. And obviously last season he was driving really well. Then he picked up the injury and was in and out. And on his day, he can be really, really effective. So hopefully he doesn't lose his seat, but that, that's who I'm going to put my my uh, money on on that one <laughs> yeah i don't think you'll be getting a text from jim kimberley anytime soon after sorry that, jim. Uh, prediction sorry. um yeah t- you know what ralph boschong was someone that i considered for first new winner he's still yet to win a race in formula two and uh, i think uh, in in the right sprint race with a reverse grid he could be uh, someone who's could, uh, could you imagine the irony if he takes his first win then he can't fund the, can't next, fund race. the next race we're both yeah. right <laughs> you know what he um he he, he absolutely could, could be someone that um uh, if financially obviously yeah um but but also in terms of his injury he did have an injury last year which obviously he ruled him out for a few races. He, I think it was Spa that he came back and did an incredible job to to, to be there in the first place and to get in a, in, into a race car again. Uh, but yeah, let's hope for, it's a better season for Ralph Boschong. He can complete the full season because uh, we know know how good he is. Um, this next question then, uh, the biggest disappointment. We don't mean disappointment. We, we all, we've been all brilliant, right? But there could be a driver who maybe doesn't quite live up to the expectations this season. Uh, if there was to be a driver, who do you think that would be, Aaron? Dennis Hauger. There's almost an expectation that he's gone to the, the champion team of the previous year for the second year in a row. And now if he doesn't fulfil that almost expected potential, everyone's going to look at him and go, hang on, how good really are you? Because he destroyed the field in Formula 3 a couple of seasons ago. And there was a lot of talk of him winning the title last year in F2. Following Piastri's footsteps of winning F3, joining Prima. And yeah, so maybe a fresh start will be good for him. Sean agrees with you. She says Dennis Hauger. Timo says Jehan Deruvela. Uh, James on Twitter says Enzo Fittipaldi. Uh, Jenny says Teo Porsche because he uh, has the greatest amount of expectation on him, which could be a fair point. Lawrence, who do you think? Teo Porsche is an interesting one. I think there is... As much as I do, I do back him to perform very well. I think with the with the level of expect, I think Jenny's absolutely right. With the amount of expectation on him, there is real potential for him to to sort of disappoint this this year, which is really really harsh on him. And I think similar to you know Dennis Hauger last season, the amount of expectation we had on him was perhaps unfair because we expected him to follow in Oscar Piastri's footsteps, which we know is very hard to do. So. I think you've got someone in Victor Martins coming up who's who is experienced. He's he's not as young as some of the other graduates coming up from Formula Three, and he showed the level of consistency through Formula Three last season that nobody else showed, and the sort of consistency that someone like Djokovic took to win the title last year. So I think if he can make a positive start, Martins is not someone who will go missing on the odd weekend and give. Teo Pochera an easy ride in the title either. Um, I know, just looking up and down the grid, you've got Teo Pochera who does come in as as the favourite on paper by all means, but you look at the amount of talent that's sort of swarming behind him and it's going to turn into a really, really tight championship battle. It really is, isn't it? I'm excited. I know the season hasn't even started yet, but I'm absolutely buzzing to uh, see the title race this season, which leads us on nicely. Formula 2 champion for 2023. Luke says he thinks Victor Martins will win back-to-back Formula 2, Formula 3 championships. Juan on Discord says that uh, Teo Porsche or Jack Doohan. We'll tell you what, we've got a lot of Jack. Zoe says Jack, Jack Doohan. Emily says Jack Doohan. Jenny and Timo also say Jack Doohan. Uh, Aaron, who do you think is going to win the title I can't look past Jack Doohan to be honest I think he's brilliant I just think, I think he's he's got the pace and it, he's, it, if he puts it on pole position often enough and he can control the race from the front by just disappearing he'll win enough races kind of the way that Djokovic won the championship last year and sort of crush everybody else's hopes with just sort of sheer qualifying performance making sure he's always there um yeah, but it's it's going to be very close. I'm expecting Teo Porsche to be up there. Ayumu Asa, Oli Behrman, Victor Martin, Zayn Maloney, Fittipaldi. That any of them could win it. Let's be honest. <laughs> So I'm going to go for Jack Doohan. Going to go for Jack Doohan. Lawrence, do you, uh, Jack Doohan seems to be the firm favourite here. Is uh, there an alternative answer? 
I think there's I think the issue is there's too many alternative answers. Yeah. Um I think I'm gonna plump for a Yumu Asa. Actually. Wow. I think big statement. I re I really do back his his sort of ability to move up in that in that second season and I think with his attitude and his pace, I think he, he has what it takes. And also I think in Dams you see a team that's rebuilding after a, a couple of difficult years, but they have that title winning pedigree and that I think in a way doesn't ever go away from a team altogether. So I think they'll be really motivated to kick on. And I think with having somebody as aggressive and as quick as Leclerc as his teammate, I think that'll give him an extra drive. Very interesting. Jack Dewan for Aaron, Ayumu Awasa for Lawrence. Uh, I'm going to throw my opinion out there as well, if you don't mind, just so that we can laugh at it at the end of the season. So uh, <laughs> You might be the one laughing if you hit the nail on the head on this one. I might be. I might be, yeah. Um, by the way, let us know in the comments who you think is going to win the title this year. Not only going to win the title, all of the, all of the different questions we've covered so far, uh, let us know your comments. We'd love to hear from you, absolutely. My pick for the title is a little bit boring, to be fair. Teo Porsche, I do think he's going to come back and I do think he's going to do, do the business and I think he's going to put himself in a really good position for a Sauber, Audi, whatever they're going to be called, uh, <laughs> drive for next season for 2024. Um, and uh, as you said, yeah, producer James, we can clip that and we'll use that at the end of the season for uh, everyone to laugh at. So uh, there you go. I almost feel like we need a second sort of dark horse selection. There's too, yeah. There's too many. There's too many. There, there are so many though, aren't there? There are so many. I mean, you, you could you could name seven or eight drivers up or down the up and down the grid that genuinely have a shot at winning the title this year through experience, through raw pace. They're, 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 yeah, there's there's a lot of names to pick from, isn't there? And even even last season, a, a few races in, I think we were still none the wiser really as to who would win the the title i mean after, after bahrain it was you know everyone was talking about liam lawson and, and yuri vips and how fast they were and it just did not materialize for them in their in their second season and then you slowly had drivers like logan Sargent who emerged as wonderfully consistent and grew and built beautifully through the season so you know it's hard enough to predict a few rounds in let alone where we are now <laughs> It, well, really it, it wasn't until sort of Spain last year that Drogovic did that double. Then he took the feature race win at Monte Carlo, and everyone was suddenly looking at him like, "Okay, he's got a big, big lead now." And obviously, Porsche followed him home in, in Monaco and was his closest contender. But from that point on, it, the Drogovic Porsche battle became the narrative. Sargent had that purple patch at Silverstone, and the the, the fortunate victory in Austria because of the the way the penalties fell uh, for other drivers. Um, I think it's going to be a lot closer this year. There's going to be multiple race winners. You might see a champion who only wins like two races. If you think about it, Victor Martins was doing a bit of research before the show and Victor Martins only won two rounds last year in Formula 3 and they were both very early on, whereas Zane Maloney only just missed out and he won three races, but they were all the last three feature races. So, you know, it's, it's, it's when you burn hottest and making sure that your bad days aren't very bad compared to everybody else. That, that's the name of the game. It is going to be an incredibly competitive and entertaining season, isn't it? And Inside F2 is the place for all Formula 2 related news, discussions, debates throughout 2023. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, follow us on social media to get up to date with all of the things we've been talking about and to get involved in the conversation as well. But that's all we've got time for today. My thanks to Lawrence and to Aaron for joining us on today's show. But from me, Fraser Ford and all of us here at Inside F2, we'll see you next time.